and welcome. We are going to delve, delve our way into uh, new topics, 7.2 and 7.7. .7 specifically, this time we'll look at photochemical smog, right, and acid precipitation. But our enduring understanding, remember, for Unit 7 is that human activities have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for the atmosphere. All right. Uh, reading for this uh, particular set of notes would accompany pages 607 through 612 from your Miller textbook. All right. And this is a reminder, not specific to these two topics, but a reminder that uh, the sources of many of the pollutants we're talking about throughout this unit have both natural and anthropogenic contributions, right? So, of course, the natural contributions are things we have to deal with. Anthropogenic contributions are things we have to try to manage and mitigate the best we can, okay? So, uh, in urban settings in particular, where we get a per certain uh, amount of certain pollutants, right? One of the things we worry about is what's called photochemical smog. Now, smog, uh, the term itself is really just referring to uh, when we have foggy conditions, uh, often associated with something like inversion that we talked about in the last set of notes, right? Mixing with people's, uh, you know, smoke from when they're burning wood or coal or whatever to uh, to heat their homes, right? That smoke mixes with the fog, hence the term smog. Now, photochemical smog is very different than that traditional type of smog in that basically what we're talking about is a chemical reaction in the atmosphere that is catalyzed by sunlight to create this orangish brown haze we see in the background here. Uh, it's a picture of Los Angeles, by the way. All right, so what it is, it's a brownish orange haze, right, formed by chemical reactions involving sunlight, nitrogen oxide and hydrocarbon. So nitrogen oxide would be a primary pollutant in that case. All right. Uh, mostly a problem in dense cities where there's lots of motor vehicles to contribute those primary pollutants. Uh, and also more of a problem in our warm sunny, sunny climates because it is photocatalyzed, caused by sunlight. All right. So if we want to make some photochemical smog, the first thing we would need is some primary pollutants. All right. So, for example, if we burn something, right, that means we reacted with oxygen. Now, whenever we burn something, right, we're releasing lots of heat. That heat can cause nitrogen gas and oxygen gas to react to react to form various nitrogen oxides, hence the X there. All right. Uh, and motor vehicles are really good at that. We're constantly uh, running that internal combustion because nitrogen is present with the oxygen that comes in through the carburetor, we do produce some nitrogen oxides. All right, we got lots of, of those vehicles in cities, which is why this is more mainly an urban problem. Now we have some excess volatile organic compounds like methane, gas vapors, other, other chemicals, right? And actually trees provide some, but motor vehicles again uh, and industry are the best at producing enough VOCs and enough nitrogen oxides that, right, uh, can be present in high enough quantities to begin reacting with each other. But we have a photocatalyzed reaction. So basically, sunlight is not in and of itself one of the materials, but it does provide the energy required for the reactions between the nitrogen oxides and VOCs to occur, right? And what happens is we get a whole bunch of secondary pollutants to sort of create this cocktail of uh, nitric acid, acid and peroxyacyl nitrates and formaldehyde and that pesky ozone, right? That we love up high, but it's bad nearby. All right, um, gets more intense with warmer air uh, throughout the day, day. So, you know, we might start forming in the morning as soon as that sun rises, but as the day goes on, more and more sunlight's present, more and more photochemical smog created. All right, uh, and again, Los Angeles is known for its uh, photochemical smog and some of the primary uh, health impacts. Uh, it is an eye and respiratory tract irritant. Right? So increased uh, issues with things like asthma, emphysema, stuff like that. All right, so this is a pretty cool little graphic organizer showing it. So again, our source of pollutants, vehicle exhaust and industry, right? Primary pollutants of uh, 
nitrogen oxides, carbon oxides, and hydrocarbons. Those undergo reactions in the atmosphere, right, to form secondary pollutants. And then we get that nitric acid, which could contribute to acid rain. We get peroxyacyl nitrates and formaldehydes and things like tropospheric ozone. Okay, so photochemical smog caused by nitro nitrogen oxides and uh, VOCs. Those are the primary pollutants. When they get in the atmosphere in large enough quantities and we get some sunlight mixed in there, those can react to form secondary pollutants of a whole bunch of different types. And those are what we refer to as that, uh, that photochemical smog, which is evident visibly uh, with that sort of brownish orange haze. Okay, now uh, let's move on to topic 7.7, .7, which is acid precipitation. All right, so we're going to touch briefly on the pH scale. All right, so pH is a way of measuring um, the abundance of uh, hydronium ions or our hydrogen ions. All right, now those of you who've not had chemistry yet, right, so pure water would have an equal abundance of H plus and OH minus. H plus is what makes things acidic, OH minus basic, right? This is a, a, uh, a not so great summary, but, right, because water is H2O or can be written as HOH, we get equal abundance of hydrogen and hydroxide. So water is what we would call neutral. Now, if something dissolves into the water to give us more of that, right, we become more acidic. If something dissolves into the water to give us more hydroxides, we become more basic, all right? So when we have a little bit of extra hydrogen ions or what they call hydronium, okay, that is when we become more acidic. And pH is a way of measuring how much extra, right, uh, hydronium or hydrogen ions are present in the water. Okay, and the further we go this way, the lower pH makes it a more strong acid, right? The closer we get to seven, it's a more weak acid, and the same thing on the base side. All right, so it's a logarithmic scale, much like uh, earthquake intensity, right? So uh, each step is an increase of hydronium by a factor of 10. Okay, so uh, a five is 10 times more acidic than a six. A four is 100 times more acidic than a six. A three is 1,000 times more acidic than a six, and so on. All right. Now, um, the reason we're bringing up pH right now is uh, we have a, an issue caused by atmospheric pollution that we refer to as acid rain. And we've talked about this briefly at other times, OK? Um, but normal rainwater, right? So as water falls through the atmosphere it does naturally pick up things like carbon dioxide right which can create uh, carbonic acid all right so normal rainwater has a ph kind of in between five and six that is uh typical and we so even though it is slightly acidic we don't refer to normal rainwater as acid rain okay now uh, things like sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxide, those are our two primary uh, pollutants that get emitted through uh, combustion, uh, from vehicle exhaust, uh, uh, smelting plants, burning coal, okay? Um, we increase the amount of those in the atmosphere, all right? So uh, power plant, vehicle emissions, etc. cetera, all right? Those are our primary pollutants, okay? What happens in the atmosphere is they undergo chemical reactions, to form secondary pollutants of sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and nitrous acid, right? So what would happen when we have an abundance of those dissolved in water, right? Notice the little hydrogens attached to the beginning of each of those, all right? We get a lower pH. So sometimes our pH might end up somewhere down in the, uh, the four range, okay? That would be referred to as what we call acid rain or, um, acid precipitation, okay? So normal rainwater between five and six. Acid rain has a little bit extra of those hydrogen ions present from the dissolving of uh, hydrogen sulfate or hydrogen nitrate, et cetera, in the water to make those acids, okay? Now, um, 
that can fall eh, with the rainfall, hence the term precipitation. Okay, now with acid rain, again, it's not as though acid would fall on your skin. Acid rain, excuse me, would fall on your skin and you would feel this burning sensation. It's not a strong enough or a uh, concentrated enough version of the acid to do that. It does, however, uh, impact systems in several other ways, right? So one, uh, it can adjust the pH of our aquatic systems, right? And that's going to impact, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, the, the pH of a pond, right? And that could have all kinds of kind of a domino effect on the aquatic ecosystem. It could also impact like how soluble things like lead and arsenic and toxic metals are, all right? Uh, ca calcium carbonate, we talked about that with like corals and seashells. Eggshells are also made of calcium carbonate, right? And so when acid rain falls on eggshells, we can get uh, uh, those dissolving away so they become... Um, thin, all right, um, and we can get uh, the leaching of nutrients, right, so acid rain might cause increased solubility of certain nutrients from the soil and leach those out, causing forests and soil quality to go down, all right, and it can have uh, uh, impacts on our infrastructure. More acidic water might more quickly erode away things like uh, concrete uh, because of those reactions, or it might cause more corrosion of our, our metal structures and so on, all right. Um, so we get our emissions in the form of sulfur and uh, nitrogen oxides. Those undergo reactions to form sulfuric acid, nitric acid, etc. That falls in the form of precipitation. We acidify that soil, right? That can impact our uh, ability for plants to grow and cause forest decline, right? It can release toxic metal ions and much like uh, acid mine drainers would do, that can work its way into our aquatic ecosystems, cause all kinds of issues. All right, that takes us to the end of this lecture.